two years ago when we were at the Trade Symposium, I spoke to you about our discrimination study on architectural paints that we had collected from various places around North America. Today I'll talk about a sub-study from that. <coughs> so that study is now uh, out. It's been published in Forensic Science International. And just to recap, it was over 950 samples, and from that we found no random pairs of samples after over 460,000 pairwise comparisons. After doing that study, we had comments back from you, our peers, saying, well, what do you do if you have limited points in comparison? There you had multi-layers, you had multiple colors. What do you do when you don't have those characteristics available to you, which is so often the case in real casework? And that's the purpose of this study. To determine our discrimination capabilities using our standard analytical techniques applied to single white layers, single layers of white paint, and to attempt to address significance of the associations that we could make. And so our analytical scheme was a little bit different than what it usually is. Of course, normally you would start with visual and microscopic examinations, right? But because we're dealing with just white paints, we needed to screen in some way. And so we started with FTIR. Then we did the visual microscopic, followed by SEM and pyrolysis. <clears throat> and we also went through a scheme such that anything that was discriminated by the first technique was not brought forward to subsequent techniques. So the original plan was to take all of the white paints that we looked at in the original study and to intercompare those, which meant we needed to perform FTIR analysis on 77 of those samples that previously hadn't been analyzed because we were able to discriminate them based on layer structure or some other feature. <coughs> the samples pretty much followed the same scheme as the previous study where they separated out based on filler content. Now this was no grand plan. This was simply looking at the data and seeing that there were some that had calcium carbonate, some had kaolin, some had both pigments, and some had neither. And that was kind of how we separated things out. And everything was going along great. We standardized our classification for discrimination where we were going to concentrate on the sheen, the color, and the surface features. When we got to the visual microscopic exams, we were, of course, going to ignore the underlayers and pretend these were all literally single white layers of paint, meaning that we did not separate these paints from the substrates or the chips that they were a part of, we just only looked at the surface layer. So we didn't create single white layers of paint. We simply treated the samples that had a white surface layer as single white layers. But it quickly, quickly grew complicated at this stage. <coughs> so plan B. We identified the best samples from that pool of 257 white paints. We determined how many of those we felt were suitable for comparison, meaning that they had a sample size that would be sufficient to do all the microscopic exams we wanted to do, as well as analysis by all the techniques we were going to be using. We wanted a surface that was relatively free of external contaminants and also imperfections, because we didn't want to have, again, any sort of bias from underlayers being seen through a very thin coating. And so the new and improved sample set contained 60 to 70 samples that we could all agree on. We roughly cut these samples down to a size of about a half a centimeter to try and provide a uniform sample size for each of the samples we were going to analyze. We then asked two colleagues who were not involved in the study but were part of our chemistry unit to randomly select 50. And the reason we did this was because after having spent so much time on an intimate level with our previous samples, we knew sample 115 and 272 were going to look alike and we didn't want that bias coming forward into this new study. So we wanted all the samples to be renumbered randomly. We then decided to also throw in five replicates of those samples. Now we didn't ask our colleagues to put in replicates of five of the 50, we just asked them to put in five replicates. So there could have been two replicates of one sample, three of another, et cetera. We just wanted a final sample set population of 55 samples. We started with FTIR. We analyzed each sample in triplicate, meaning each of us in the study, all three of us, each of us analyzed every sample once. We used two identical FTIR instruments. We used a microscope accessory on the instrument with a diamond compression cell, where we used the, one of the diamond windows as the substrate for the sample collection, and we collected our, our uh, spectra in percent T, or you know, observed in percent transmittance. We then evaluated the data. Uh, two of us evaluated it independently. And the conservative approach that we used for discrimination was that if one of us um, would not discriminate a sample pair, then that pair stayed together. And of course, replicate analyses were critical at this stage um, in order to 
try and assess the significance of subtle differences. So here I'm showing you replicates of one particular sample. And you can see that there is some variation. And this variation is, of course, likely due to sample prep, overabsorbance. Someone's put too much sample in the diamond cell. That someone's probably me. Um, others are much better at sampling. But these are replicates all of one sample. So we know what kind of variation we can expect to see for one sample. Here's another sample. OK, you see, again, we've got a bit of overabsorbance here from the kaolin. But this is all uh, replicate analyses of one sample. This is another sample. And now here's a comparison of those last two I showed you. And you can see, again, that there may be some subtle differences in areas, but nothing that we're going to call as uh, discriminating these two samples at this stage. So here I'm showing you uh, five different samples that we consider to be uh, consistent, if you will, in terms of FTIR. But this sample at the bottom here, the one that's in red, we felt could be discriminated from the rest of this sample set. So at the end of FTIR, these are the groupings that we were left with. Every sample across the top in its own box is considered to be discriminated from all other samples in the study. And then the second row, if you will, those are all samples that are considered to be part of the same group. So there you see sample 24 has been discriminated from that group. So after FTIR, we had 15 samples that were discriminated from the rest and nine groups that remained. Now back to visual and microscopic. So now that we have more manageable data sets, we did side-by-side -side comparisons. Each analyst, two analysts did side-by-side -side comparisons independently. We had already controlled for sample size differences. We used three different light sources. And a third analyst was consulted if there were any discrepanc discrepancies between the two analysts as to what was considered to be discriminated um, versus not discriminated. And again, the conservative approach was if one or more analysts said you couldn't discriminate, the samples were kept together. So try as I might, I've looked at this, um, com this particular comparison on, on many screens. And I don't think you can see the differences in color as well as you can back in the lab. So you're just going to have to kind of trust me that these two samples were discriminated. And I know that it's um, a flaw in the study that you can see that there's a substrate difference here. But again, we were not trying to take that into account. And we did not take the samples off of the substrates. We just treated them as single layer samples. Also, you can see that the sample on the right, we've already already sampled this before we photographed it. And obviously, we've already sampled it before we've done side-by-side -side visual comparisons because we've already done FTIR at this point. But that's OK, because that's sort of the um, things you have to deal with in casework anyway, right? So at the end of the visual microscopical exams, I'm still leaving these up here, but they're not, they haven't been carried forward at this point. The only samples we're looking at are these here. And different colors mean samples that have been discriminated. So here you've got, this has now been discriminated from this group. The one in green has been discriminated. But the white samples form a group and the yellow form a group. The other thing to point out on this slide is that sample 42 now gets represented twice within this group because it ended up being a bridge in that group between those two groups. We were able to distinguish that group based on visual and microscopical exams into two groups, but we couldn't distinguish 42 cannot be distinguished from either group. And rather than letting it be a bridge between two groups we thought were different, we just now carried it forward as a member of two different groups. I hope that sounds clear, because I know what I'm talking about. I hope you do, too. <laughs> five, so five samples were discriminated, and now we have 13 groups established, where, as I said, sample 42 is now a member of two different groups, two distinct groups. For SEM, we um, utilized backscatter imaging to delineate layer structure. This was more important when these samples got carried on to pyrolysis, if they were going to, because we wanted to make sure that for sampling for pyrolysis, we weren't going down into another layer. So using backscatter imaging of embedded chips allowed us to see just how deep or how thick that initial top layer was, as well as to note homogeneity and relative particle size. All samples were analyzed at least twice, imported into a spectral software, um, in order to do comparisons. And um, EDS was then performed both on the embedded chips to evaluate <coughs> cross sections as well as using thin peels to have a larger scanning area. Based on SEM, we were able to distinguish uh, six, discriminate six samples based on an element either being present or absent in a group or ratio differences. And here's an example of that. You have the aluminosilicate ratio quite different between the top sample versus the bottom two, but more importantly, you have the presence of calcium 
much uh, strongly represent, more strongly represented in the top sample than the other two. So after SEM, we have more discrimination, four samples discriminated, 12 groups go on to pyrolysis, and you can see sample 42 remains stubborn and is part of two different groups. It couldn't be distinguished from either one. For pyrolysis, um, we estimated sample size. We did not weigh our samples. We used an auto sampler. We used uh, quartz sample tubes with quartz wool as a spacer. And the pyrolysis chamber was ramped up to 880 degrees Celsius. We did not derivatize samples. The GC mass spec configuration was <coughs> pretty standard. And then replicate analyses were performed if we uh, discriminated samples. So if we ran samples and we thought they were discriminated, we repeated the analysis in order to confirm that discrimination. Here are two samples we compared. One contains isobutyl methacrylate, the other does not. They're discriminated. So after pyrolysis, we are able to discriminate eight more samples. But that's not the end of the story, <coughs> because all I've shown you here is the discrimination we were able to achieve for each technique. But in doing an analysis, you're not just looking at each technique as its own entity. You're then going to look at the totality of the evidence. So at the end, we didn't just have what we were able to distinguish after pyrolysis. We went back and looked and said, those samples that we were conservative on, where we had subtle differences and we kept them together, looking at the totality of the exams that are performed on those samples, can we say anything more? So undiscriminated samples were evaluated using a combination of techniques. And the order in which that evaluation was done was that all the instrumental techniques were assessed, and then we looked at how the visual microscopical examinations played into that. So we didn't want something subjective uh, introduced first in determining whether these samples could be discriminated. We looked at the instrumental exams and then looked at the visual microscopic to determine if uh, there was anything we could say about these samples and whether they could be discriminated further. So based on that, you see that sample 42 finally gets discriminated, and not only from one of the groups but from both of the groups. In fact, four samples were discriminated, looking at a combination of the techniques that we used. And so just as a microcosm of that, I'll look at this, um, no way, I haven't tell you. Four additional groups had subtle differences. And there were five groups where there's no differences. Sorry, I'm not doing this well with this pointer. But you can see that there are, there are five sets of samples where there's no discrimination. Not surprising, those are the blind verification samples. There are groups where there are subtle differences that have been um, noted, and then their samples have been discriminated. So looking at that group of 16, 25, 42, and 49, let's look at that. Well, here's the FTIR analysis, and where I really want to focus your attention is around 1,100, and I really want to do that by using the pointer. <laughs> and so anyway, around 1,100, um, there are differences between the red and the green spectra that are quite obvious in comparison to the blue and the purple spectra. So now let's look at SEM, <coughs> again, at those same four samples. If you look at the alumina silicate ratio, the two middle spectra have different ratios than the top and the bottom spectra. Would you call them different on that? Maybe, maybe not. So then you look at the potassium. Um, if you look at the potassium, which is just to the left of the calcium peak, um, there's some differences there. There's also maybe some differences in sulfur. So again, there, there are becoming patterns evident here that maybe these samples could be discriminated from the top one and the bottom one. But pyrolysis is giving you no differences between one of those samples that FTIR clearly distinguished from the other. <coughs> so what's, what's the uh, takeaway message there? FTIR is showing you differences. SEM is showing you possible differences. Pyrolysis is not showing you any. But when you add in visual microscopical differences, you see that samples 25 and 42 were discriminated from 16 and 49, which lo and behold is a blind verification pair. So at the end of all of the analyses, we have five pairs that remain, the blind verification samples. And we have four additional groups or pairs that we did not discriminate, but we felt did contain subtle differences in the data that might make you question. And certainly, if you were in casework, you'd say, well, there's differences there. I'm not going to call them the same. But for purposes of this study, we're keeping them together to be conservative. So what's the summary of our discrimination? We have nine pairs of groups that remain, the five verification samples, two additional groups, which means four samples, two groups of three, which is six additional samples. And those latter four groups or pairings are the ones with the subtle differences. The only pairs with no indications of physical or chemical differences were those that originated from the same source. So back to discrimination power. 
after doing FTIR, which was fit all 50 samples, over 1,200 pairwise comparisons, <coughs> that yielded 68 indistinguishable pairs or a 94% discrimination rate. Looking at the totality of the examinations that we conducted, we had four groups with subtle differences, and so we call it, we call it inconclusive, which gave us 99% discrimination. And this, these calculations do not include the blind verification samples. So at the end of the study, we conclude that uh, the overall discrimination scheme gave us 99% discrimination, but even if you could only do FTIR on your sample because of its condition, its size, et cetera, we got 94% uh, discrimination, and therefore the ability to differentiate samples of single white layers of architectural paints is really far greater than what we had expected. We were surprised by how well we were able to discriminate these samples. So future work, I call this my Chris Palinick slide, we, um, we, are, we are looking at Raman spectroscopy. Our colleague Maureen Bradley has looked at these samples by Raman, and um, we, uh, we also obtained samples um, from Bell and Fido, from the papers that they put out in applied spectroscopy five or six years ago. They looked at white paints. We're looking at those as well, and we're going to explore PLM as well. And we want to thank Scott Ryland. It's sort of a trend that we thank Scott Ryland in this session. No wonder he's the ASTI uh, recipient of the uh, Locard Award for Excellence in Trace Evidence. And Chris Bomarito, the two of them were the, kind of the ones who helped suggest the study to us. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>